What's up guys, LQ here with the LQ Review. And I'm here to do my countdown. Now that I've seen X-Men Dark Phoenix, I'm gonna do my countdown of the X-Men movies. So I'm gonna rank them from worst to best. And, uh, and we'll see if you guys agree with me, if you guys don't agree with me. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just see, uh, how, how much you hate me after, after seeing, <laughs> after seeing this, uh, this countdown. Now remember, um, that this is all subjective. There is no objective way to measure movies. It's all subjective. And, and, and you probably are going to disagree with me. And that's okay. That's what movies are all about. Actually, there's 12 movies in the X-Men because I'm going to include... The Deadpool movies. The Deadpool movies are part of the X-Men franchise, so let's go ahead and include the Deadpool movies as well, shall we? Um, so, um, there's 12 movies that we're going to count down, and this has been like a huge gamut. Uh, I talked about it in my Dark Phoenix review, that the great X-Men movies are really great. The bad ones are really bad. And then there's a lot in between there. So, I'm going to talk about my top, my, I'm going to rank my 12, and then we'll just see what you guys think about that. So let's go ahead and get started with number 10, by far the worst of the X-Men movies, X-Men Origins Wolverine. I believe most people will probably put this one at the last. This one was clearly rushed, and this one clearly had story problems from the get-go. Uh, you know, they went and told Wolverine's origin story, but they didn't tell it in any kind of compelling manner. And this is the first one where they kind of, where they, Fox kind of made the decision that continuity doesn't matter anymore. This is the movie where they made that decision because this movie had Sabretooth play a huge role in Wolverine's life. A huge role. And when we saw Sabretooth later on down the line in the first X-Men movie, they didn't even know each other. So this is the one where where the continuity kind of went out the window for Fox and they said, let's kind of just, let's keep some loose threads where we tie the movies together in a loose way, but we're not going to worry so much about continuity. We know Marvel cares very much about their continuity, and that's one of their strengths. This is definitely a weakness for the Fox X-Men movies. Their continuity has not always been on, on point. Definitely on point here. I mean, definitely um, the case here in X-Men Origins. Not to say there's nothing to like here. Uh, you know, the, this is the one that introduced us, even though it was a horrible, horrible, horrible sinful sinful is the right word it was a sinful rendition of deadpool this is the movie that allowed deadpool to happen it cast ryan reynolds as deadpool as wade wilson and it it made without this movie the other deadpool movies probably wanted to happen so something good did come out of this um there was a very nice fight scene at the end of the movie where wolverine and Sabretooth team up to take out deadpool even though it was not deadpool it just wasn't. It wasn't Deadpool. They they team up to take out this this uh, engineered mutant, and it was a really nice, fun fight scene. Um, other than some some cool action sequences, though, there was nothing really nothing really of substance here. Striker was back. I love Striker. I think Striker is the best X Men villain, but. Even Striker was kind of watered down in this. So X Men Origins Wolverine was was just a bad movie. And it didn't make a lot of sense, and it muddled the origin story, and a few really good action sequences couldn't save it. So that's number 10. Number 9 is X-Men The Last Stand, the third X-Men movie. I think a lot of people might have this one a slightly higher on their list. It's going to be near the bottom for most people, but I think a lot of people have this one slightly higher. But for me, this one just felt cartoony. This one really did. It felt it felt like a cartoon. And that's, and that's a sad thing, because... Of the stakes, you know, with X, X2, X-Men United was such a wonderful movie. It's one of the best comic book movies ever made. Uh, and, and it was, it left on such a high note that the expectations were through the roof for X3, The Last Stand. And they just didn't do anything with it. They killed off Cyclops right away. They killed off Professor X halfway through the movie. And they just made a lot of really questionable decisions, um, storytelling-wise. I like the idea of having the Mutant Cure being a thread throughout this. But I feel like there's two different movies in one movie here. I feel like the Mutant Cure could have been a movie. 
and that the Dark Phoenix could have been a movie. And the Dark Phoenix actually took a back seat to the Cure storyline. So the more interesting of the two storylines took a back seat. It had a really nice ending with uh, Wolverine facing down the Dark Phoenix. But it just wasn't a compelling, good movie. The story was kind of compelling with the Cure, but the movie itself, it just left a lot to be wanted. And like I said, it just felt really cartoony to me. And and, and that's not what you want in your live action X-Men movie. You want it to, to, to pay homage to some of those old cartoons and old comic books, but you don't want to be watching it thinking, yup, this is a live action cartoon because that just doesn't work for me. So Last Stand is number nine. Number eight is X-Men Apocalypse. I had a lot of hype for this movie because I love the Apocalypse storyline. And then they cast Oscar Isaacs to be Apocalypse and I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Oscar Isaacs is a great actor. And then the movie was just flat. The movie was flat. From the get-go to the end, it was flat. Um, not much else to say about it. I mean, even Apocalypse himself was just a, a watered-down villain of the week type character. And Apocalypse should have been this ultimate threat for the X-Men. And it just didn't feel that way to me. It just didn't feel that. And that, I never felt like the X-Men were really in any real danger. Um, you know, Michael Fassbender did a lot of really good stuff with Magneto in this movie. You know, him joining Apocalypse and then turning against Apocalypse at the end. All that was really good. And I love his version of Magneto. But most of the movie just felt like Apocalypse recruiting his, his horsemen. And then the final battle. So, yeah, this was just, it was a missed opportunity for Fox. X-Men Apocalypse was a missed opportunity for Fox, especially after the, the really intriguing um, post credit scene in X-Men Days of Future Past. Everyone was like, who's Apocalypse? We need to find out who Apocalypse is. And then, boom. It just wasn't a very good movie. So, Apocalypse. Uh, number seven. Number seven is the recently released X-Men Dark Phoenix. Yes, I put X-Men Dark Phoenix above Apocalypse, above The Last Stand, above Origins. It was not as bad as people said that it was, as people say that it is. It has some very nice action sequences, especially at the end. The end action sequence is one of the best action sequences in the whole X-Men franchise. The problem is that the first act was just kind of okay, and the second act was such a mess. I was bored. I was legitimately bored during the second act. And then you get to the third act and it picks up and it's a lot of fun and the action sequences are great, but the third act wasn't quite enough to save this movie from kind of just being a disappointment. The Dark Phoenix is the storyline in the X-Men comics. It's the it's 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 it. It's the storyline. It's 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 the, it's the one that they're known for. And just to kind of just to kind of muck it up twice is kind of depressing. So I hope now that Disney has the X-Men, they're not going to be afraid to try to tackle this story as well. Because it's a story that needs to be told right. But this movie was not a train wreck. It just wasn't particularly good. That's how I described it in the review. Not a train wreck, just not really that good. So that's number seven. Number six is the first X-Men movie. X-Men. This movie was a very simple movie in the sense that you got Magneto as your bad guy, you got Professor X as your good guy, they both have their teams and they clash at the end. And and they clash once halfway through and then they clash again at the end. It was a very simple by the book comic book movie, a comic book movie by the numbers, but it was very good and it people forget this movie reestablished comic book movies to the to the general public. Batman and Robin ruined them. Batman and Robin put comic book movies in the drain. And it was a couple years before X-Men came back out and said, guys, we can do this, we can do it right. And they did. They did it right, and it was compelling, and it was fun, and it was interesting, and, and it was a serious adult take on comic book material. And it brought comic book movies back. After that, we got X2, obviously, we got Spider-Man, and then, and then the floodgates opened. So, X-Men, number six. Um, let's see, five and a half, that's how I'm going to do these. I'm going to put the Deadpool movies in half points. How's that sound? Because they're not really X-Men movies, but they should be worth mentioning. So five and a half is Deadpool 2. Five and a half is Deadpool 2, a fun, hilarious movie. Not quite as good as Deadpool 1, but it was just a fun, silly movie 
that kind of expanded on Deadpool's relationship with the X-Men. So five and a half is Deadpool 2. In at number five is X-Men First Class. A lot of people are going to have X-Men First Class a lot higher than this. Not me. I was a little bit bored through some of X-Men First Class, but the villain, played by Kevin Bacon, was great. Seeing Professor X's and Magneto's relationship and how they how they eventually drifted apart due to ideologies was great. Um, yeah, there's so much in X-Men First Class. The setting during the Cold War, the Cold War era setting was great. There's a lot of this movie that's great. The problem was it got a little... Whenever they were not focusing on Kevin Bacon, Michael Fassbender, or James McAvoy, I wasn't that interested. Good news is those three characters got the majority of the, of the focus. But other than that, I wasn't that interested in the tertiary characters. There's a really nice cameo by Wolverine. But X-Men First Class does not make the, the, the top tier of X-Men movies. It's a good X-Men movie. Make no mistake, it's a good X-Men movie. From X-Men on up, they're all good. But this one just doesn't make the top for me. So that's number five. Number four, this is sure to be controversial. Number four is the Wolverine. I really like the Wolverine, guys. Taking Logan to Japan and having that storyline play out in Japan was wonderful for me. This was a comic that I read when I was a kid. It was one of the first comics I ever owned. It was the limited series that took him to, uh, I think it was four comics in it, that took him to Japan Man, it was such a good story. And to see, I mean, they didn't adapt it exactly. Not really at all, to be honest with you. But the idea of taking him to Japan and and, and letting him, to, stripping him from his powers, it was kind of an Iron Man 3 in that sense. Stripping him from his powers, stripping him from his superhero persona, and just letting Logan be Logan what was, was really good. It was a really nice character study. Um, it falls apart a little bit when he fights the Silver Samurai. It gets a little silly at that point, but I gotta tell you guys, I really like the Wolverine a lot. I think a lot of people overlook just how good the Wolverine was, because it was a really nice Wolverine story. And that's why it's so high on the list for me at number four. Number three and a half is Deadpool. Deadpool... Deadpool showed us a different way to do comic book movies. Number one, it showed that we could have R-rated comic book movies and they could be done very well and that people will still pay to go see them. Number two, it showed us this self-referential yet serious take on the comic book movies. This exists within the X-Men universe, a very serious universe, but it's very self-referential, very funny, and just kind of bombastic compared to the other X-Men movies. So this definitely changed the way movies were made. If it wasn't for Deadpool, we wouldn't have gotten Logan. And Logan is one of the best comic book movies ever made. So Deadpool was great, and I admire Ryan Reynolds' passion in getting it done and making sure that, uh, that, that he fought for years to get Deadpool to happen. And when it finally did happen, it paid off for him, it paid off for the studio, it paid off for everybody, because it ended up being a huge hit. And it was very, very much a movie that was focused on him, but they did open it up to the X-Men world. You know, obviously, we had Negasonic Teenage Warhead. We had Colossus. It's definitely in that X-Men universe while still standing on its own. So that's three and a half. Number three. All right. These top three are all three wonderful, wonderful movies. Just, just, uh examples of how great the comic book genre could be. I would pit these three against almost any MCU movie. And we all know how much the MCU is revered. I revere the MCU. I would pit these three against almost any one of the MCU movies and say it's just as good or better. Number three is X-Men Days of Future Past. What a great storytelling. What a great passing of the torch from the original cast to the new cast. Lots of Easter eggs for X-Men fans. A really great moment between Patrick Stewart and James McAvoy. Another movie that's carried by Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, yet it gives other characters moments to shine. You know, the the, the first class, the, the, the X-Men from first class, it's their movie, but Wolverine is there carrying it for them. But they all have moments to shine, including Jennifer Lawrence's Mystique. This is the best Mystique we've ever gotten. And I've always been very down on Jennifer Lawrence's Mystique. Quite frankly, I don't think she cares all that much about the character. It showed in Apocalypse and it showed in Dark Phoenix that she just doesn't care. But Days of Future Past, she did a good job. Legitimately did a good job. 
and Mystique was vital to the to the to the story. And Mystique was uh, was at no point in the movie did I roll my eyes at this character. This character is well done in this movie. Um, but yeah, this is Wolverine's movie, and and they tried very hard in this movie to connect the dots to other movies that happen, including even X-Men Origins Wolverine, because he's found by, by Stryker at the end of X-Men Origins Wolverine. So they tried to, or at the end of Days of Future Past. So they definitely tried to connect the dots. One thing that this movie did well was that I felt like it had stakes. When the Sentinels were coming in at the end, and Magneto, uh, Ian McKellen's Magneto, the mutants, they were dying. They were dying to, to give Kitty Pride more time to, to let Wolverine accomplish his mission. This movie felt like it had stakes, and it had a really nice ending that felt like it just tied up all the loose ends. Felt like it, it erased first uh, or last stand, which it really did. It erased last stand, and uh, it just kind of reset the X Men franchise. Something that was needed at that point. Unfortunately, after that, they didn't do a whole lot after the reset because then came Apocalypse, then came Dark Phoenix. Not very good movies, but Days of Future Past did what it had to do. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. So that's number three. Number two. I'm going to get the... the Everybody watching this is about to get their, their ire up. And they're about to get ugh, angry. Because number two is Logan. Number two is Logan. Such a great movie. Please don't misconstrue me putting it at number two as saying it's not good. Because it is so good. How Patrick Stewart did not get a Best Supporting Actor nomination for this movie is beyond me. But... It was a great kind of post-apocalyptic X-Men story. It's not really a post-apocalyptic world, but it is a post-apocalyptic world for, for the X-Men. And to see the bond that Wolverine and Professor X still have, to see Professor X's hope, especially upon finding um, X-23, the hope that he has that there's a future for the mutants, the heartbreak surrounding Professor X's storyline all the way through his storyline... And just the, the, the almost primal terror of Wolverine's clone being introduced in this. It, it, was, it was such a good, and I think primal is a good word. It was a primal movie. The finale in the woods was excellent. And the ending, the ending left me in tears. It was one of the best send-offs I've ever seen for a, for a character. And, you know, I... I, I Seriously doubt we're ever going to see Hugh Jackman, Hugh Jackman play Wolverine again. But what a great way to go out. With such an iconic movie. Playing such an iconic role in such an iconic movie. With such an epic ending. Say, you know, sacrificing his life for, for what is essentially his daughter. It, it was just so well done. So Logan is number two. But number one, if you haven't figured it out yet by process of elimination... Number one is X2, X-Men United. That is my favorite X-Men movie still. You know, the, the assault, Stryker's assault on the school was just so well executed and so well handled. You had a lot of small cameos in this movie, including Colossus making a, a really nice cameo. He wasn't a main character in this movie by any stretch of the imagination, but he didn't need to be. He had a really get, great cameo where he saved some kids and... The assault on the school just felt, it felt claustrophobic and it felt, it felt scary. You know, putting yourself in the shoes of these kids, they're having their school overrun by mercenaries, by this, to the government. It would be scary. And you felt that tension. You felt the panic in, in, in the, in the kids as they're, as they're escaping. Um, and then you had a really nice group that, that escaped, including Pyro, Iceman, and, when they escaped to, to Iceman's house, you could feel, and his, and his parents arrived, you could feel the tension. Now, they've always said that this was a nice, that the X-Men was a metaphor for uh, homosexuality. And you kind of see that in this sequence in the house. How, have you ever tried not being a mutant? You know, it was just, and it wasn't on the nose, but it got its point across. You know, it didn't slap you in the face with it, but it did what it had to do. And then the prison break scene where uh, Magneto escapes from prison and ultimately Magneto's X-Men joins Professor X's X-Men. 
I love that. I love that. I've always felt that Magneto, in in these movies, in this movie world, anyways, I always felt that he was kind of an X Man, anyways, right? He 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 was a little. Uh, um, he was obviously very misguided, but his heart was always in the right place. And I love the idea of him teaming up with the X Men, but also having his own agenda. The and he had some nice moments in this movie. Um, Mystique had some nice moments in this movie. The fight between Lady Deathstrike and Wolverine at Alkali Lake was wonderful. The whole showdown at Alkali Lake was wonderful. Even Stryker's demise was wonderful. The only complaint I really had about this movie was the way they handled Professor X and really Cyclops at some point. They took Cyclops out of the game early. He kind of disappeared about halfway through the movie and then we didn't see him show up again until the end. But really Professor X, you know, he's so powerful that they kind of just took him out of place so they didn't have to deal with his powers. And I'd like to have seen a little more of Patrick Stewart's Professor X in this movie, but he had a role to play in this movie that made sense for the story, so whatever. Um, yeah, and then the end. The end is one of the most iconic endings in comic book movie history. I feel like there's been so many X-Men movies, and there's been so many bad X-Men movies. Let's be honest here. There haven't been that many bad X-Men movies. There's been maybe three or four out of 12 bad X-Men movies. So the majority of them have been good. But there's been enough bad ones and enough disappointment that I just think people overlook X2. The ending, when Jean Grey sacrifices herself, was epic. It was an amazing sequence. And then at the end, there are always possibilities. And we see the phoenix in the water. I remember in the theater when they said there are always possibilities. And then you see the phoenix in the water. I remember the theater saying, oh, they're going to. Like, my eyes got all wide, and I was like, they're going to. And they did, but... We're not judging X3 here. We're judging X2, and X2 is great. X2 is the best X-Men movie. You might disagree with me, and that's fine. You might think Logan is the best, or Days of Future Past is the best. You might think Deadpool is the best, and that's all fine. It's all subjective. If you think that's the best, that's great. I can't argue with you. I could probably argue with you if you said X-Men Origins was the best. I'd probably have that argument. But if you said Logan, Days of Future Past, First Class, Deadpool, you know, if you said any of those were the best, no argument here. For me, it's X2 X-Men United. I think it's a great X-Men movie, and it still holds up today. So let's recap. Number 10, X-Men Origins Wolverine. Number 9, X-Men 3, The Last Stand. Number 8, X-Men Apocalypse. Number 7, X-Men Dark Phoenix. Number 6, X-Men, the first one. Five and a half is Deadpool 2. Number 5 is X-Men First Class. Number 4 is The Wolverine. That one's sure to be controversial. Number three and a half is Deadpool. Number three is X-Men Days of Future Past. Number two is Logan. And number one is X2 X-Men United. Let me know in the comments whether you agree, whether you disagree. I'd be happy to hear what you think. Please subscribe to my channel. I'm trying really hard to get to that 100 subscribers. And you can help me get there. And as always, thank you for being here at the OQ Review, where we talk about all the geeky, nerdy stuff that we love to talk about. And until next time, we'll catch you later.